Okay, so Bruce, you've been intrigued by supernatural thinking. People often believe things that defy rationality. So let's start with some examples of that. So there are the familiar ones of ghosts and spirits, which, uh, you know, form the basis of a lot of storytelling in our culture. But I'm also interested in the the more obscure things like uh, the rituals that people often engage in that they might have special things that they do. Uh, sports rituals, I think, are fascinating that people have to touch certain things or wear certain clothes. And then there are more obscure things like the sense of being stared at. Most people think they can tell where they're being watched. And, and that's an interesting one because that doesn't sound supernatural to a lot of people. But when you consider it from a scientific perspective, then it's not really easy to understand how that could be done by any natural process. So really, it's all those sorts of things which in the cold light of day and you look at them through the scrutiny of a scientific lens don't stand up. So anything like that is in, in the category. And, and when you look at things like that, you realize, wow, this actually cuts across cultures and as far as we can tell across time as well, right? Everybody seems to do this. Yes, and that's that's exactly one of the interesting things, uh, which suggests it might be universal. Uh, whenever you find aspects of human behavior in different cultures, that strongly suggests that it might be something to do with our biology rather than being entirely culturally specific. Uh, there are, of course, very specific cultural supernatural beliefs, but if you look at them more closely, you can see that they're very often based on the very same premise. So, for example... Uh, life after death, souls and spirits and ghosts, you'll find in just about every culture. And so you categorize this uh, under the umbrella term super sense. So give us, mm. g give us an understanding of what this means. Well, the super sense term, uh, it was really the almost appealing to the intuitive nature that these things seem like they're something you can detect or that they feel real. I mean, this is the important point. For many people, when you ask them, why do you believe in these things? They say, well, I've had experience of it uh, or I've had that uh, sense of being watched or I've sensed the presence of people in houses or ghosts or whatever, that uncanny kind of sense of uh, reality. And so I wanted to capture the supernatural term, but also a sense in which these things feel correct. Because ultimately in the book, I argue that they really all really come from a intuitive way of thinking as we have as children. And so this supernatural thinking, you argue that this is rooted in our deep mental architecture. So for me, uh, supernatural phenomenon include anything like energies, forces, causes, entities, anything which uh, people use to explain the experiences that they've had. Uh, so that also includes all the religious ones, but I'm also more interested in the ones which are not obviously uh, derived from pure religion. And that includes everything else I mentioned earlier, like superstitious rituals and personal kind of, you know, our attachment to objects and sentimentality. These are things which I find fascinating because I think they evoke the same sort of underlying mechanisms. And those mechanisms really come from a brain which evolved to make sense of the world. And you can see this operating in children. I began as a developmental psychologist, and so I've always been fascinated in the way that children make sense of the world. So we talk about them having intuitive theories, which are ways of understanding the world, evoking causal mechanisms that are not taught formally. And that's the important point. Uh, these are things that children spontaneously come up with as their own explanations for why the world is the way they are. So, for example, when it comes to uh, making a distinction between living and non-living things, they spontaneously think there must be some sort of energy or life force in a living thing, which gives it sort of autonomy and self-propelled motions, as opposed to more inert things like objects and wooden blocks and stuff like that. So children are already starting to draw a distinction between the biological and the non-biological in the way that they think about that. And once they've made that distinction, they then also start to evoke the notions of intentionality. They start to infer minds, um, having causes for making things do the things they do. And, and that's the beginnings of mind-body dualism, which is a philosophical position. And that, uh, I think, is also the basis for a lot of beliefs in, you know, the, the body and mind being separate. And if that's the case, then, well, once the body's gone, maybe the mind continues to exist. And therefore, you have the basis of spirits, souls, and ghosts, and the, the afterlife. So, in kind of understanding the world around them, children are evoking the kind of causal mechanisms or intuitive theories which lay the foundation for what can become adult supernatural beliefs. 
And I think that's the way that religions actually are, are working is that they kind of operate or they're successful because they tap into what are our inclinations about what could be possible, um, ghosts, life after death, and, and so on. So the idea is you think, look, here's a living object, but there's a, a mental state that's different. And so when grandma passes away, mm. she still exists, even though her body is buried, right? This is what dualism means. We have the mental and the physical being separate, whereas the view of modern neuroscience is that these things are linked. The reason that's the view of modern neuroscience is because... Anytime a person gets damaged to the brain, let's say a stroke, a tumor, traumatic brain injury, things like that, we see very specific changes in who they are based on mm. what's happened with the brain. As Pinker put it very aptly, he said the, the mind is what the brain does. So it's a sort of, I, mean, I hate the analogies of software and hardware, but yeah, the mind is the operating system in many ways. And neuroscience, as you say, tells us that if you damage or disease the brain or drug it, it'll change the concepts of, or the content of the mind. But the, the general point is that uh, most people would assume that the mind is separate to the body. Uh, but neuroscientists tend to sort of be more materialistic about that process. But let's just assume that you've gone for the mind being separate from the body. Then once the body's gone, then if you don't see it as being tethered to the body, then that allows for a whole lot of uh, beliefs. So it could be things like astral planning, you know, leaving your body and traveling around the world or projection, all the sorts of things that people readily acknowledge or uh, identify with as being phenomena that they think they've experienced. So there's a whole lot of, um, you know, there are a lot of natural phenomena that people reinterpret as supernatural. It's not to say that these things couldn't possibly happen. I mean, for example, take telepathy. Uh, telepathy in its current state, we would argue, well, being able to read someone's mind without technology would be a supernatural ability. But, you know, you've worked with uh, computer human interfaces. It won't be long before you can actually start to read the output of the, the brain and maybe that could be transmitted to another person. In effect, you could read minds at a distance. So uh, it's not impossible, but at the moment, it's just not, it's improbable given our current understanding of the technology and our scientific theories. 